Hello, and welcome to the Money Marketing Podcast. I'm Kimberly Dondo, Digital Content Manager. And in this week's Weekend Essay podcast, we have feature writer Amanda Newman Smith asking, Does fertility and finance need to be awkward? Take it away, Amanda. I remember having a chat with CI expert founder Alan Lakey about the trigger points for advisors to have a conversation about protection. Inevitably, becoming a parent was one of the main ones, but people only tend to tell their advisor about it once there's a child on the way, or in some cases after the baby is born. Couples often don't even tell their friends or family that they're trying for a baby for all sorts of reasons. They don't know if it'll even happen. It may take longer than they thought. And who needs the pressure of that being the topic of conversation amongst their nearest and dearest? Couples may experience problems along the way that they would rather keep private. And even when they're expecting, they often don't want to make the news public until that first scan at 12 weeks. All those reasons for not telling family and friends also apply for not telling your advisor. It is also easy for prospective parents to get so swept up in their baby preparations, then bumble around due to lack of sleep once Junior arrives. So the reality of having to include another person in the financial plans and protection policies may kick in a bit later than it ideally should. Lakey's point was specific to protection advisors in that covering a child on a critical illness policy at birth is very different to covering a child a few months later, when any conditions they may have been diagnosed with would be viewed as pre-existing. All this popped into my mind recently when a relative was over from New York. She met her husband in her 40s and was up against her biological clock when they decided they wanted to start a family. After tests and consultations that concluded the chances of her getting pregnant with her own biological child were slight, she and her husband thought it made sense to skip straight to adoption rather than explore IVF. The decision to adopt was driven partly by financial considerations, not just medical assessments. With no NHS in the US, they just didn't see the point in throwing money at something that had a slim chance of success. Of course, they had other options to consider, like IVF using donor eggs, but that didn't seem much different to adoption in their eyes. So they kept their money away from the fertility clinics and have used it to bring up two gorgeous adoptive children. Seeing them all together, nobody would doubt that they made the right decision. Everyone knows that becoming a parent has financial implications, but there's less focus on the financial side of how you achieve parenthood if you need some sort of intervention. Same-sex couples, people with conditions that have impacted their reproductive systems, older women and parents struggling with secondary infertility. In other words, finding it difficult to conceive after having at least one biological child. There are just some instances where fertility treatments such as IVF can help. Some people do qualify for fertility treatment on the NHS, but that depends on various factors. The NHS website says the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence Guidelines recommend that in England and Wales, IVF should be offered to women below the age of 42 who have been trying to get pregnant for two years. Women who have had 12 cycles of artificial insemination, with at least six of those using a method called intrauterine insemination, also qualify. The website goes on to state that the final decision about who can have NHS-funded IVF in England and Wales is made by local clinical commission groups and their criteria may be stricter than the NICE guidelines. This basically means it's a postcode lottery. According to the NHS, the cost of private IVF treatment varies, but can be up to 5,000 or more per cycle. Nobody knows in advance if the treatment is going to work in any given cycle. So if people cannot get NHS funding, they need to think about how far they can afford to go with their IVF journey. It's a big financial and emotional decision, but I've only ever seen reference to finance and fertility treatment on one advisor website. There may be others, but that one sticks in my mind because I've personally never seen it before. There may be several reasons for that. We all find talking about the reproductive system a little bit awkward, even with the medical profession. So I doubt that financial advisors are among the first ports of call for clients who are dealing with infertility. But to my mind, it would make sense if financial advisors at least mentioned financial planning for fertility treatment as something they could help with. It doesn't need to be insensitive or awkward. Just a case of if you ever need it, we can help with financial planning to fund IVF. Data from the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority, the fertility regulator, shows that over 50,000 patients a year are treated at HFEA licensed fertility clinics in the UK. 
I personally know people who have successfully conceived after IVF that they've paid for themselves. The financial side of it is not just about the practicalities of finding the money and setting it aside. There's also the emotional aspect and realising that if you set this money aside to pursue your dream of having a child, whatever else that money could have been doing for you will be impacted. That's something my husband and I have faced. We experienced no problems in having our three kids, but when our youngest was about 18 months old, we thought about having one more child. We didn't tell anyone our plans, not even close family. Part of that was not wanting to deal with other people's reactions, as we were already a fairly large family. I'd met an old work colleague at a friend's leaving doom when i just had Ryan, my youngest. Amanda, you must stop having children, she had said. Don't have any more, another couple were friends with advisors around the same time. Even some family members felt I had enough on my plate with three kids, a job and a dog. However, by the time we were thinking about a fourth child, I was 42 and it never happened for us. My age and having three children already meant there was nothing the NHS could do for us. There were no tests. Our difficulties were just attributed to a natural decline in egg quality. So I had a chat with our GP who said it was up to us to determine how far we were willing to go to add to our family. By that, she meant paying for private fertility treatment and looking at all our options, like donor eggs. Perhaps because we already have children, none of that appealed to us. We had a brief look at a few fertility clinics on the web, but didn't bother contacting them, as we knew this road wasn't for us. We'd reached a similar conclusion to our relatives in the US. The chance of success, given my age, can justify the cost and the roller coaster of emotions, unless we chose egg donation. But that option didn't sit well with us. It wasn't exactly an ethical decision. I'm certainly not opposed to science giving nature a helping hand. It was more about whether our imagined fourth child would grow up feeling different to their siblings and develop some sort of identity crisis. My husband and I would never want to deter anyone else from going down the donor egg route and we'd have given it serious consideration if we'd had no children at all. But it just wasn't right for our personal circumstances. The financial implications of IVF also played a big part on my side of the decision making. Just having a go at fertility treatment at my age, I was at the upper end of age limits for everything bar donor eggs. Felt like we'd be gambling away money that could be going towards the future of the children we already had. I experienced a mix of feelings when discussing it with Dan, my husband. My response was realistic and emotional. I knew that there was a real risk of paying for one, two, maybe three rounds of fertility treatment and still ending up with nothing to show for it. How would I feel then, knowing that money could have helped one of our kids through university or used as a deposit on their first flat? Dan didn't see things in quite the same way. For him, spending money on some form of IVF didn't mean taking money away from our existing children as it wasn't earmarked for them. He was less emotional about the financial side. To him, it was simply a case of, we have the money, do we want to do it? In the end, we did other things to see if we could improve our chances of conceiving without medical intervention. I bought loads of vitamins and for five or six months, I paid £60 a week for acupuncture sessions with a local qualified practitioner specialising in fertility and women's health. A bargain given that acupuncturists affiliated to the fertility clinics charge double that. It's a bit like when you're planning a wedding, you find that everything somehow costs double. Fertility issues are, in the words of Arthur Daly from the 80s TV show Minder, a nice little earner for some people. So once a week, I would get my pulse and tongue checked before laying on a treatment couch with a heat lamp on my stomach for about 20 minutes, listening to some instrumental Spanish guitar music and sometimes the rain thudding onto the skylight above me. I was told I had a cold stomach, which apparently wasn't good for fertility from the perspective of Chinese medicine. Acupuncture brought some initial improvements, according to my acupuncturist, but these were very short-lived. We had to pause the sessions for a couple of weeks while I went on family holiday, and my acupuncturist did too, but once they resumed, everything was back to square one, and I saw no progress in the following few months. So I called a halt to those sessions, and that money now pays for home tutoring for my youngest who is great at maths but needs extra help in reading and writing. Talking to a financial advisor could really help with this sort of thing. Listen to clients as they work through their feelings about IVF, helping them weigh up all the pros and cons and deciding that even if they can go for it from a financial perspective, is it what they really want to do? I'm sure plenty of advisors do this, just like they discuss other areas of their clients' lives, but we don't get to hear about it, and we should. Thank you, Amanda, for another interesting 
weekend essay podcast. We do the hope that you enjoyed it. Please do keep up to date with all our new releases via Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else you get your podcasts from. You can also keep up to date with all our new content published on the Money Marketing website, as well as our Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. See you next time.